Welcome back to Hot Takes and Deep Dives. This is Jess. And with me, I have Tony Trius, who is the co-host of the Madonna podcast, MLVC. Hey, Tony. Hi, Jess. Thanks for having me. This is, <laughs> this is going to be fun. <laughs> now, I hand-selected Tony because I often cite the Christopher Ciccone book, Life with My Sister Madonna, as the juiciest celeb tell-all that I've come across period. And I've read a lot. Like I read, I've read all of Andy Cohen's books. I've mm-hmm. read Artie Lang's books. I really do love to dig into everything that's out there. And you don't even have to be a super insane Madonna fan. I think if you're just a fan of pop culture, yeah. in particularly if you're a fan of the 80s and the 90s, which just what the culture, how it was all happening in New York City and LA mm-hmm. and Miami I think this is, it is candy for the soul. (laughs) I absolutely agree because after Blonde Ambition, but before music, there was a barrage of these unauthorized biographies, you know, by people like Tara Borelli and uh, Andrew Morton, you know, these, you know, are supposed to be, you know, the biographers of our time, but not really because these books sucked and they were full of misinformation. They were full of, um, you know, rumors, um, you know, things that like your pedestrian Madonna fan would call bullshit on. And, you know, we just wanted a Madonna dish tell all, but we weren't going to get one at least until Christopher decided to uh, cash in and write a book about his sister. And then it was like, we're definitely going to get one because because this guy has has an axe to grind, right? <laughs> I mean, I think we should start. Well, I guess let's let's first introduce you. So, your podcast MLVC. So you do it with your co-host Stefan, who I also love. Yes. And so, how long have you guys been doing it? So we started the podcast a week before the uh, Madame X record announcement. So it's been a little bit over a year, and you know we went into this with. Blind eyes. We had no idea, you know, um, that the Madame X rollout was going to happen the way it would, that the tour would happen the way it would, the fact that we would be able to see the show as many times as we did, and also the fact that we would end up interviewing people, not only Madonna fans, but people that have, you know, worked and collaborated with Madonna. So this has been a crazy ride and um i'm really grateful and it's been a lot of fun and and i've learned so much about madonna because Mm -hmm. i always thought that i was like a pretty knowledgeable fan but i never thought that there were so many things that i just didn't know like what's like what are something key things that you can pull out that like you were like holy shit i had no idea oh you know just you know who choreographs certain tours you know i no obviously i knew there was a choreographer but i had no idea that it was you know so so intricate and so exact for, I mean, you, know. you guys have interviewed nikki and donna her backup dancers nikki and donna even the most casual madonna fan right. i think would recognize them from truth or dare mm-hmm. and like they were her backup singers like on the records too all mm-hmm. the way through what through music yeah yeah through music and you interviewed them you interviewed did you interview both Jose and Luis? Mm, just, um, just Luis. Okay. Extravaganza. Uh, we the Vogue yeah. dancers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, these are this these all these people that worked on Blind Ambition were amazing. You know, Kevin Stay and Oliver Crooms. They were amazing to talk to, and really, you know, when you're a kid and you're watching these people, and you know, this all you know, Blind Ambition meant so much to me growing up because you know I got to see you know, Latin people, gay people represented on stage. And Madonna was like, you know, kind of grabbing you by the hand and showing you this whole new world. And I'll forever be grateful. But the fact that I was talking to these people and asking them questions that literally have been 30 years in the making, it was really overwhelming. And, uh, and I understand now that I was like, I was, you know, I, I want to, I want other people to hear this and I want everyone to have kind of the same experience. Through, is is there know? anybody, I guess, what's been your favorite interview that you've done? Like if somebody is like, oh, let me go check out this podcast. Mm-hmm. Which interview would you point them to that you think highlights the show the best? Oh, I really love the Donna DeLore episode. Um, the Nikki episode was overwhelming because it was, you know, we talked for almost three hours, you know, wow. and I didn't want it to stop. You know, mm-hmm. and she was just going, you know, and that was that was really sweet. Um, I also enjoyed our recent birthday episode. Uh, you know, Stefan reached out to, you know, 
past guests and they recorded music and you know like we had bright light bright light amazing. sing take a bow like are you kidding me right now <laughs> yeah. he's amazing and you know donna sang i rise which you know come on so yeah so i had this idea to kind of do this episode where we solely focus on basically just pulling out everything mm-hmm. interesting that we found in the book written by her brother this is a tell-all written by madonna's brother christopher ciccone now i have only listened to the audiobook. Mm-hmm. And if I can give you one piece of advice, because I do feel that people will want to dig into this after like mm-hmm. listening to Wait to Say, is to listen to it on audiobook. Right. Um, I bought the book, obviously, when it came out. I think it was a 2009 or 2010. So I went out and purchased the physical book. I remember reading it in one sitting, throwing it across the room. And I wasn't impressed by it. And wow. I just... I, I thought it was mean spirited. At that time, I think I was in love with I was in love with the hard candy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think there was like a tour hasn't been hadn't been announced yet, something like that, you know? Mm-hmm. And she was also about to or in the process of divorcing Guy Ritchie. So I just felt like it was just Oh, this is like, you know, that's so interesting because the first time so I listened to this book for the first time a a few years after Mm -hmm. it came out, I think I wasn't really aware of when it came out. And I listened to it probably maybe like eight or nine years ago. And I was transfixed. Mm -hmm. I was transfixed by his voice. Just the base level. Yeah. This dude's voice. This guy's voice is so it's like hypnotic in a way. Mm -hmm. Right. Like well, it's incredibly deep and like it, it's like you, you really get like sucked into the world that he's describing. Well, yeah, I mean, so that was, was that's what was missing when I first read it. There was nothing to really tie it together. So I did listen to it, you know, uh, just recently. And oh, my God, I didn't want to like I didn't want to stop. You know, I was like, I would love for Christopher Ciccone to speak to me about many topics. You know, yeah. I mean, yes, his voice is 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 great. But, oh, there's so much snark and bitterness and unintentional humor, you know. And I found it to be, like, in parts, like, pretty hilarious. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it's... it's I mean, it, guys, this is this is Madonna's bitchy gay brother. Right. Bitching you about her. Yes, I mean, he... Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, you'll notice the tone, too, because he'll say... He recounts a lot of conversations that they had. At one point, he to her says to her in a letter he calls her an aging pop star yeah. in the letter um so yeah let, let's get started we're gonna take you literally like chronologically through through the book it's basically seeing madonna through his eyes and the reason why christopher is the one to you may be like well why is one random brother of hers writing a book about her like mm-hmm. what's the involvement he was actually by her side from the beginning, literal, the birth of her career, the mm-hmm. very first recording, and lived with her in New York City all the way. They were, ex- he worked for her. He designed every home of hers. Yeah. He designed and directed Blonde Ambition and The Girly Show, which I didn't know before reading this. And he was her interior designer for all of her homes. Like, she literally said to him, you can di- design my... At first, she was like, you can design my home. You can design my stage show. Right. But, Jess, you're forgetting one very important thing. Ooh. He was also her dresser. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. He started... Well, yeah, you explain that. That is the one thing that he hates, right? <laughs> he was... So, basically, when he... Well, we'll, we'll get to yeah. it. But but the the crux of it is he initially his first job um well he actually was a backup dancer i think for lucky star in the the video if if you watch the early club dates that there's random videos somewhere so it's everybody um he's dancing in the background the holiday that they shot in the uk and that they shot in france we've all seen those he's in the background you know they're wearing the same him and erica bell wearing the black dancers outfits and then madonna in the front he was in the Lucky Star video. And yeah, so I think up until Like a Virgin, he was he was actually touring with her, you know, doing club dates. Mm-hmm. Um, as like an actual dancer. Yeah, as an actual yeah. dancer. And then he would take on a much more significant, prominent role, which one would argue furthered her career. Like they, this was a mutual, him. this, this guy was talented, mm-hmm extraordinarily ta- talented on his own merit in terms of like art interior design painting dance dance they all have this gene in them yeah. but 
one really couldn't exist without the other. He wouldn't go on to, you know, he will tell you later, like yeah. all the celebrities he, he wound up designing their homes and doing work for. It doesn't go that far unless you're Madonna's brother. Exactly. And he, although he didn't explicitly mention this in the book, I also feel like he was a very important buffer between Madonna and the rest of the, the staff or the crew on these tours. Um, you know, maybe that's why she wanted him as her dresser. You know, she didn't want anybody that she didn't know touching her, uh, undressing her. Um, also, I mean, you could also speculate that that's the same reason that she begged Debbie Mazar to be her makeup artist on True Blue when Debbie mm-hmm. was like, I don't do that anymore, mm-hmm. you know? So I feel like she needs to be surrounded by people that she can Lean manage on, yeah. and, 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 and be herself with. A recurring refrain is, Christopher, I need you. Mm-hmm. Always. She's always saying how much she needs him. Get on a plane. Mm-hmm. You're going to come here. Like, I need you to do this job. I need you to do this. Right. Instead of, what are you doing these days? Right. I need you. Come here now. Right. You know? And it, what's, it, what's fascinating is that she's currently writing this screenplay mm-hmm. with Diablo Cody. So it, it, I am very interested yeah. to see. Because you know what? I believe every word in this book. However... I believe this is one side. This is a one-sided yeah. version of a very true story. We need to hear the other side. Do okay. Here's the million-dollar question: yeah. Do you think Christopher will be a character? Do you think she's going to represent him? How can she do this movie without there being a? Christopher? I know, and and I was thinking about that because in the um, you know, in the Instagram live that she did, she did mention that, you know, she was having trouble with that one scene where she's speaking to her sister, Paula. It doesn't seem like she has a relationship with Paula at all. I know. I mean, the only thing I remember about Paula is that they used to have the same eyebrows and Paula was on like the Oprah show in 1988 talking about how hard it was to be Madonna's sister. And then you never saw her again, you know? I feel like Melanie is the one she's closest to, but it's because that's uh, who Joe uh, Henry yes. is married to. And Madonna always loved, I mean, maybe I'm speculating, but I, I think like Madonna loves that like indie recognition that she gets when she, she works gets, with like, Joe street, Henry. She gets like street pride. Yeah, yeah for, for the, a couple of you guys who may not know, for example, uh, the song Don't Tell Me off right. of music was co-written by this singer songwriter joe henry who is madonna's sister's husband Mm -hmm. and there was another song they did together i forget Um, which one i'm sure you guys will oh he co-wrote jump off confessions and devil wouldn't recognize you off of hard candy but um all right should we get into it i mean listen the first quote that jumps out to me is i was born my mother's son Mm -hmm. but i will die my sister's brother girl (laughs) i mean it's kind of true it's sad but it's true you know, a lot of people have to live under their parents' shadows, but this is ridiculous because I feel like maybe all of her siblings have that problem. You know, I'm, you know a lot of them are, I guess all of them are anonymous. He starts out the book, it basically, it the, sort of like the prologue to the book, he drops you into, it, they're in the midst of like the girly show. Yeah. So like he has, at this point, he has designed and directed the girly show. Um you know, she's two years older than him. They're jogging like six miles a day that they're on tour. That Their schedule is like they're up by nine. They're mm-hmm. in bed by 11, which I found so interesting because now we're so familiar with like her schedule now that like she doesn't start these shows until well after yeah. 11 p.m. It made me wonder what changed. What changed? Yeah, because let's go back to like, I'm going to tell you a secret. And she's like the tour is over and she's like, I've been waiting 14 weeks to have a drink, you know? And yeah, wa- Oh, she, it, the, the strictness yeah. around alcohol, alcohol, but is even, even watching that, I was like, I feel a little betrayed. Madonna doesn't drink, you know, at some point she started, she started. Drink. I think Guy Ritchie got her on that. He owned a pub, <laughs> yeah, but she hated him so much. I know. So, so I, <laughs> yeah. I feel like that's when that started to happen. And that's when, yeah, that's when the lateness started, you know, mm. Confessions was the first show I saw where she was like severely late. Oh, so Confessions was. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. Again, just like the highlights and Mm. then we're really going to break it down. We're going to go like chronological through her life, through Christopher's eyes. Yes. She would ban alcohol from the dressing room. Um, She again, this is so interesting Mm -hmm. because this still like to this day holds true. Refuses to use air conditioning. She can never be warm enough basically mm-hmm. is and that's an ongoing thing like at the the uh madame max shows she was screaming yeah about the air conditioning she's always complaining that it's too cold because it's bad for her voice 
she would pretend not to care about negative reviews. Um, a little anecdote he says about the Letterman, the infamous Letterman appearance in mm-hmm. 92, was basically she was terrified just like being on live TV and she couldn't think of anything else to say. Mm-hmm. So that's why she behaved yeah, that and, way. Yeah, and you know, hearing that... It just kind of made sense when you start to think about certain TV appearances and you're like, wow, she just it's it's an armor. You know, it's almost like she's like, I'm just going to be this person because I can't really Mm -hmm. confront you as myself. Uh, One thing I love uh, from the get go is like he has these crazy details that we would never know about any other way. Like, for example, the pink Puerto Rican Maha face powder bought on Sixth Avenue. (laughs) Obsessed. (laughs) I mean, the details about <laughs> yeah. New York are like, oh, yeah, because I, tr- I mean, you guys live in New York as well. Oh, yeah. So, like you guys. Are- I love knowing that his studio was on Fourth Avenue, you know, between 10th and 11th. He, he made reference one reference to something getting us uh, something on 16th Street, mm-hmm. literally a block from me. It was like, oh, my God. I always love knowing what Madonna wears as perfume. You know, at one point it was tuberose. And then this one, he says it's Yannick Goutal, Gardenia Passion. I know now she wears Portrait of a Lady, but, you know. How do you know that? Um, I think Kim and Kourtney Kardashian went backstage for Madame X. They talked about it. I think someone said, oh, that smells great. She's like, it's Portrait of a Lady. I love that. I love <laughs> knowing that. Thank you for that. Um, oh, he said one dancer on every tour yes. will receive special treatment. This is going back to... Always the, the heterosexual. Yes. She will pick out the one Mm -hmm. straight guy. This is going back to the Virgin Tour and the Who's That Girl Tour. Most famously, the one who it was on Blonde Ambition. The the way we all know this is Oliver Crooms, who, P.S., you had on your podcast. Mm -hmm. Was that a good interview, by the way? It really was. It was actually very cathartic. At first, I was a little nervous to talk to... For everyone. Oh, wow. (laughs) Um, I didn't... I didn't... I, I didn't know how he would react to me and Stefan, you know. Um, but, you know, just I, I had not been really aware of his evolution until I saw Strike a Pose. He did have a lot of, like, really great anecdotes about spending time one-on-one with Madonna because, and, and that makes sense according to what Christopher said. Um, you know, they had um, nicknames for each other and they hung out, you know, and hip-hop became part of the show because of him. Mm-hmm. But... Um, the you know the thing that really struck me from uh talking to him was when he just kind of like apologized to the gay community for all his how he felt about gay people in the mm-hmm. past or how he you know kind of lashed out against them and and that was that was really sweet i mean his heart is in the right place and he's he's a really great guy and i i you know i'm so grateful i got to talk to him you yeah, know very interesting and i think actually he's still teaching dance. yeah he teaches dance in las vegas uh-huh. uh he went to vegas to do all those like uh dancing shows mm-hmm. you know like goddess starring nomi malone no, yeah. just kidding <laughs> nomi no malone. there was one i think there was one uh had like a water element it was like the splash at the i don't know one of those big casinos but yeah it's like you know he's a featured dancer in all these you know vegas shows so good luck to him when they open up again so Basically, so that's sort of like the overall. Yeah. So yeah. To, to sort of close that out was basically, yeah, like one dancer will get special treatment going back to the very beginning. And it's the one who she kind of brings closest to her when she's bored of the gay dancers, right. one who she like really wants attention from. I forget the name of the guy in um, Virgin Tour, but it was definitely Shabadu for Who's That Girl? He was like the dance captain or choreographer. Interesting. But, and it's interesting how that still plays out today. Yeah. Now it's, how do you say his name? Her boyfriend. Oh, um, Anamik. So that's the end of the prologue. Basically, listen, you guys all know Madonna's from Michigan. Mm-hmm. and So the whole Chaconi clan, she's in the, in the middle of five kids. And this is like zooming in on Christopher. Yeah. And basically, Madonna was, dance, was already dancing. And he, as like her little younger not yet gay brother, but like she clocks him as gay from mm-hmm. like minute one. He basically follows her into each new world yeah. that she would enter. So initially it was ballet, then modern dance. She brought him to his first gay bar in Ann Arbor. Mm-hmm. He was visiting her in college, like her one semester, or her one year that she did at University of Michigan, yeah. Ann Arbor. She was the one who encouraged him to go to dance class with her teacher, Christopher Christopher Flynn, mm-hmm. who I think was the first gay man that he ever met. Right. And probably the first gay man she ever met. Right. Um, what's funny about that story is that in The Advocate uh, 1991 um, 
it was right before Truth or Dare, Madonna did this very, I mean, at that time, it was kind of revolutionary because Madonna spoke to a gay publication about gay topics, about AIDS, without censure, and no one had really done that before. And, like, no one that was A-list ever went to the advocate to say anything, you know? So this was crazy, and, you know, inadvertently or maybe on purpose, she outed Christopher in that article, it was almost as she was getting gay credibility for being the sister of a gay man. You know, he resented her for it. I mean, you know, in 1991, you don't really want your shit hung out like that. Um, You know, because the landscape at the time was very, you know, volatile, you know, with AIDS and, you know, just a lot of intolerance. So, yeah, so Madonna in the Advocate article, she talks about him as a teenager. Kinda, oh, what does she say? Kind of out of turn. You know, she was saying, you know, my brother, when he was younger, he was surrounded by girls. He was surrounded by women. Um, you know, everyone wanted to know what his secret was. But I knew that he wasn't involved romantically with anyone. And so I took him to uh, a dance class. And on the way home, I asked him if he had anything to tell me. No, wait, it was, this was after the gay bar. And she was in the car and she asked me, like, do you want to do you want to tell me anything? Are you, you know, and he didn't. But, you know, she told this story uh, before he had the chance to tell the story. So, I, oh, yeah. Oh, I'm getting what, yeah. what you're saying, because that was way that was. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. That was 1991. Yeah. She's saying this. And he doesn't write this fucking book until 2008. Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I yeah. think he does say something along the lines like, literally, well, once exa- again, she beats me to the punch. Literally, it's the exact same story. Like, this is a fact. Like, this is, you know, it's the truth of their childhood. Mm-hmm. Um, I did find it interesting how he really took note how she kept changing her appearance. Like uh-huh. there was Madonna the punk, there was Madonna the drummer, there was Madonna the, the cheerleader, the cheerleader <laughs> initially. Like I found that to be interesting. And what was would... also interesting is that those personas would return in different ways throughout her life. Mm-hmm. Don't think we didn't notice Madonna. <laughs> and also like he would, he talked about, you know, on just various trips that they would go on even even as young kids they would see something like he remembers seeing some like geisha imagery somewhere yeah. and then years later she appropriates that appropriates that for ray the, of light. for ray of light yeah. with nothing really matters can we jump to one of my favorite sections oh, of the book please, yeah. which is when she invites him to come to new york <laughs> because she can sleep on his she because he can she invites him to to come out to New York because right at this point he's in Detroit come out to New York he's a dancer mm-hmm. you can you can get a job you can dance you'll be able to do some of my everybody like club dates she, he arrives where where was this hold on a second it was, was on the Upper West Side like 99th and Riverside Ma- Madonna says come to New York to dance she says you can live with me he comes to live on the Upper West Side. She opens the door. She's like, yeah, you can't stay with me. And this begins a pattern of behavior of her saying one thing and then immediately changing her mind and fucking him over. Exactly. And ramping up his resentment a notch every time. This started from when they were 17 years Mm -hmm. old. She would give him like a carrot and then take it away. Mm -hmm. But then be like, all right, Christopher, you can do this. So in the end, she actually did hook him up with a place to live in the East Village. With, you know, someone he actually became very close with. So it all worked out. But I I, I love that part. I mean, it's terrible. But I mean, like, I call it, oh, you can't stay here. (laughs) I had to, like, hear it a couple times because it's horrifying. And he stayed there for, like, two nights and there were roaches everywhere. And, ugh. She, and then the next time, like very close to that. So at this point, everybody is out and she's about to go just do club dates around mm-hmm. the city. You know, I think he even says he's, he's she's about to do club dates at Studio 54, the Pyramid Club, Roseland Ballroom, which like I can't believe that Roseland. La- like I went to the closing night oh. of Roseland when Lady Gaga like closed yeah. it out. Um, I even saw Madonna at Roseland. Remember she? Did yeah. That, like, yeah. I saw her there, too. Uh, my biggest greatest memory of roseland is seeing grace jones there amazing i mean that place is crazy yeah but i can't i I feel like that place is maybe too big for her but can't you can you believe that she was doing club dates oh yeah no and you know what else she was doing um you know we had uh guy guido on the show who was the director of madonna and the breakfast club he saw her in long island in some dinky little bar when she performed everybody and um holiday oh my god Uh, crazy and then Jump to, uh, you know, Dance Party USA, Dancing on Air. Yeah. She performed there, too. 
you know, if you look up that footage, it's hilarious because you can imagine she got on a Peter Pan bus <laughs> at Port Authority, oh, totally. went to Philly and, you know, shut up with all her fishnets and, um, you know, ripped clothing. And yeah, it was like, it was so dodgy. But, you know, I mean, she was doing that everywhere. I mean, this was 1981, mm-hmm. 82. Two. 82, 82. Was this 82? Yeah. So I was born in 82. Mm-hmm. So they're literally like, okay, Jess is now born. Yeah. And like Madonna is like on Madonna's a bu- doing on amusement park. Long Island. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, there was, there was, there was um, one of those track dates that they did in France and it was like in this abandoned parking lot. I mean, it's, it's the randomness of the places they performed, you know, and also he brought up when they were on their UK tour, it was the first time they went abroad for Madonna self-titled and they went to the Hacienda, which is that storied club where New Order came from, you Mm -hmm. know, among other bands. And, you know, it was a crazy rowdy crowd and they pelted her with bottles and food or whatever else. And, you know, I'm sure they called her all kinds of names and yeah, they didn't, they didn't enjoy Britain as much, but I mean, come on. I mean, they were doing three, four songs a night. So but I'm before sure before he went on tour with her, there was a fuck over. She yeah. said, you can come with me, come dance, be my back, my background dancer mm-hmm. for everybody. She's like, you know how good we look together. They danced really well mm-hmm. together. Like he said, that's another like recurring motif in the book is that how good they look together. They're literally the masculine, feminine. And you know what's funny is that I didn't know that was her brother until I saw Truth or Dare. Like I did not make yeah. the connection, you know. Like they have the same mm-hmm. features. Yeah. It's it's eerie, but it's also it like gives you chills in such a mm-hmm. good way. It's like oh my god, he really did all of this. Yeah, and um, because of that, like he obviously had the dance talent, and because their bodies just genetically they fit together they looked really good together and this would go on to them just like dancing at new year's eve parties everybody wanted to see madonna and christopher dance together yeah i mean you know like like he said in you know in the book he goes my sister needs me i'm on the next plane Mm -hmm. but the thing with that is that nine times out of ten madonna would say well i don't actually need you anymore right that's what i was gonna say with the fuck over (laughs) she says come dance with me but she fucked him over she replaced him before they even started she's yeah. like b- blowing him up saying like we look so good i don't know why he was replaced at that early stage but then eventually she's like come overseas and that yeah. and that started the official because you know working relationship I, I feel like madonna probably wanted shinier people around her and when they just couldn't come through you know she's like well christopher will always be there to pick up the slack you know oh by the way little fun fact mm-hmm. he says for the lucky star video he was paid two hundred dollars no royalties. Oh, my God. You know, oh, that's another recurring theme. Her really stiffing him. Yeah, with yeah. With payment, which we're going to get into. into the that, money yeah. becomes a big, big but thing. I, I didn't know, you know, the thing about the Lucky Star payment is that anyone that was around in 1983 watching MTV, I mean, that would have infuriated me because that was on literally twice an hour. Mm-hmm. It was everywhere, you know? So if you're seeing yourself everywhere and you only got $200 in your hand... That's got to make you crazy, mm-hmm. you know? I wonder if he was recognized. I mean, I, I don't think he was because, I, like I said, I didn't, I didn't know who he was as a person until... No, but if like, they're playing the same video over and over, like, don't you recognize the background dancer? The backup dancer? Yeah. Like, I would think that like, he would become like, recognized on the streets of New York, but I, I'm just like Right, imagining. no, and, and that's, what I was, that's what I meant to say is that I, until Truth or Day, I was like, oh, that, I finally made the connection, mm-hmm. you know? But also, I mean, I couldn't Google anybody in 80, 89 or 90, so. <laughs> um, okay, let's jump to, I think it's time for the Virgin Tour. Yeah, it's okay. definitely time let's for the Virgin get, Tour. Let's get into it. So basically, <laughs> the Virgin, so like she already has, you know, she's released the second album and she hires him as Tony was saying earlier, to be her dresser. So basically backstage in between songs, he was the one who had to get her undressed and change into the new costume in like under 10 seconds, whatever the time is. Mm. And he just describes it being like an insane amount of pressure and that he was more nervous than she was. Yeah. If you, I, Madonna seems like the type of person, if you're working with her and you do something and she catches it out of the corner of her eye and it's not approved... You're going to get it and you're probably going to get it for a couple of days, Mm -hmm. you know, that would make me crazy, you know, having to walk on eggshells with someone like that. So I can understand what Christopher was feeling and I can also understand why Madonna thought that 
for her dresser, she needed somebody like that. Somebody that she could punish at will, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, Without fear of, well, this person's going to quit and I can't go through like a different dresser every week, you know? Christopher wasn't going to quit. To that end, Mm -hmm. he says that he became the one person to whom she could vent, trust, and that he was the one person who would take the abuse because she would scream at him backstage. If he fucked up a pin or Mm -hmm. like anything, she would just like rail at him, go on stage and then go back as if like nothing ever happened. Right. Like those, there's a couple of instances that happened on the Virgin tour that, um, you know, you guys have to listen to him describe it because it's like, I mean, you start to get anxious hearing him describe all this stuff. It's like, I don't even want to be in the room if that's happening. The best part of this is he never told anybody no. that he was his dresser. He was embarrassed and humiliated that this was his job. Exactly. Especially when like the, the shows would come to New York and all his gay friends would show up and he would have to kind of like pretend he was doing another role in the tour as opposed mm-hmm. to like, I, I, there's nothing wrong with dressing her. I mean, look at Tony, the guy who's been dressing her since reinvention. He's amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, he had a featured role in uh, I'm going to tell you a secret and he's, He's worked with Cher. He's worked with everyone. He's he's amazing, you know, and mm-hmm. and he takes a lot, you know, but he gets the job done and he does. You don't see him complaining. Um, so it was as as her dresser. It was his job to make sure that the costumes were in perfect condition. Yeah. Every outfit was made in triplicate mm-hmm. because she would sweat through everything, which like makes sense. So, yeah, they were tour with three versions of every outfit and he had to make sure that the outfit changes were done in a minute and a half. Yeah. That's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure. And also, during this time that he met his long-term partner, mm-hmm. this this guy, Danny, and this became an... So they were together, I think, for t- a, ten de- years, a yeah. decade. And throughout the 10 years of their relationship, Madonna was always a source of tension. Yeah. Like, basically, Danny resented the fact that Christopher just would lay down for her. It, right. Basically, that his sister could just, like swing him around on a leash yeah and plus the fact that madonna barely acknowledged danny as a part That's of christopher's so life weird. that why is so that, weird why do you think that is i don't know i mean there it could be something cultural it could be madonna just jealous that someone's taking attention away from her you know hmm. um that struck me as really weird. yeah that struck me as really weird but um That really bugged me, you know, because, you know, as their relationship evolves and the years pass and things change. But he was also very threatened that Madonna was Christopher's priority, Mm -hmm. not Danny. Exactly. That was really like the crux of it. But nevertheless, they were together for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, Somewhere in here, she meets... On the set of Material Girl, she meets Sean Penn. Mm-hmm. And he says, basically, like, this was, it was love at first sight and forever. Right. According to Christopher. And this is when Christopher starts to realize that Madonna is attracted to men that are, like, their older brothers and their father. You know, a typical macho, working class, forget about it kind of Italian guy. You know, it doesn't have to be Italian, but, you know, Madonna likes those tough you know, 50, you know, someone who could have been like a greaser in the 50s, you know, like totally. a tough guy, you know, totally. And there's a lot more on like, there's the, a lot the more, Sean yeah. stuff coming up. So for the who's that girl tour, was there anything significant? Basically, he just says that like, it was just the next level up more theatrical than the Virgin tour. It was arenas. It was around the world. Um, you oh, know. yeah, it was a world tour. Yeah, they time. went to Japan. Still her dresser. Still her dresser. Um, you know, he did say something that I took offense to. Okay. You know? <laughs> well, you know, these are things that just don't need to be said. You know, there was a, one point where he's talking about her voice on tour and then he like goes into like a painstaking description of how it compares to Nikki Harris and Donna DeLore's voices and how she uses their voices to make her sound better. And I'm like, Christopher Ciccone, you don't need to say that. Well, he would. He also said how she would turn off. Is it Nikki? Yeah, who she had would the turn off voice? Nikki's. Yeah. She would turn off Mick, Nikki's mic. Yeah. Because at this time she was with Nikki and Donna. Right. She would turn off her mic. Why? Because she overpowered her? Yeah, she overpowered her. I mean, the reason, and you know, Donna told us this when, um, you know, she was on our show. The reason she was hired is because she was able to mimic Madonna's voice. And so they were able to, you know, vibe off each other. You know, Madonna would sing something, she could mirror it, and vice versa, you know, up to a certain point, of course. Uh, And then when Nikki came in, it added that soul, as Christopher said. But 
I mean, you know, we we've heard Nikki, and she 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 does what she wants to do. You know, she riffs and she sounds amazing. So, I can understand someone with a different voice probably saying like, "Turn her down." <laughs> mm-hmm. He also says that it was again during the "Who's That Girl" tour that like he was encouraged to go on this tour, maybe just like by himself because the threat of AIDS was like growing. Yeah. Large, it was looming larger and larger in the gay community. Right, Martin Burgoyne, Burgoyne had just died, mm-hmm. and Keith Haring was, you know, was sick at the time, and yeah. So th- this was getting real to them. You know, people they knew yeah. were dying. This was also around the time that he started collecting and purchasing art for yeah. her, and this is huge. And eventually, yeah, is I mean, part we're not downfall. we're not talking. You know, go to Bed Bath and Beyond and get me a couple frames. I mean, these are like Picassos. These are Delimpicas. He would. She would send him to Sotheby's yeah. and say, like, this is my budget for like for this auction. So he would regularly mm-hmm. go to the auctions and bid on Frida Kahlo's, on Picasso, mm-hmm. all, all of this stuff. And he says over all of the years that he worked for her, mm-hmm. he spent $20 million of Madonna's money, which he says increased by, two, by 2008, oh, yeah. the time of the book, by over $100 million. Yeah. So Madonna's like very savvy when it comes to like making these invest. And what's so interesting on the the live that she did with Diablo Cody just to promote the screenplay they're writing, she made a throwaway comment like, "Are people even buying art anymore? Like, are people buying art right now?" And because I just did this, this book is so fresh in my memory. Yeah. I was like, "Holy shit!" <laughs> and you know, you know, what's yeah. funny is that I read this years and years ago um, where Madonna got. They say Madonna got the idea to collect art. She was married to Sean Penn. They went to Jack Nicholson's house, and he had Dylan Picas, and he had, um, you know, Gauguin's. He had, like, you know, I, I didn't know this, but Jack Nicholson apparently is one of the most astute art collectors out there. So um, Madonna shows up at his house with Sean Penn, and she gets jealous. She's like, why don't we have that, you know? Let's dig into Sean Penn. Yes, let's do it. So Sean Penn through the eyes of Tr- Christopher Ciccone. Mm-hmm. I'll let you start. Well, I mean, this is probably Christopher's another experience where he's dealing with her sister dating someone who's probably not as tolerant of gay people or maybe has never had an experience with gay people. So that that's a factor in there, too. He wasn't homophobic, though. Um, I mean, I've read he he doesn't get explicit about it here, but I've read that, you know, Sean Penn would kick people out of the house, you know, you know, and yeah, be yeah, like, yeah. I don't want these people here, you know. But he did a thing with Christopher. Yes. They... He's like, Christopher, come here. I think like he basically describes Sean Penn as being a recluse yeah. and just happiest when he was with Madonna at home. And Christopher lived with them yeah. for a period of time in Malibu together. And, and at one point, Sean Penn says to Christopher, like, hey, like, come here. And he cuts his finger. Mm-hmm. And he has Christopher cut his finger. And he's like, let's be blood brothers. And he's like, now we'll be brothers forever. Cut to years later. At her wedding. Was at their wedding? Yeah, it was at her wedding. Really? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was after they were divorced. No, no, it was at the wedding. Oh, my yeah. God. Really? Okay, so I... Apparently. That's what I recall. From, oh, I don't even remember yeah. that. So years later, he pulls him aside. Sean Penn pulls Christopher aside. And he's like, hey, like, remember when we became blood brothers? And he's like, yeah. He says, you don't have AIDS, right? And Christopher, like, told him off. Yeah. You know, it was, a, you know, the that hot mess wedding where, you know, people had shotguns and uh, they couldn't hear anybody because of the helicopters. I mean, it just, Cher and Andy Warhol were there. I just can't, I can't. <laughs> it sounds like, I mean, he goes into the filming of like the, the movie that they did together. Shanghai Surprise, yeah. Which was like totally pan. Like all they did was fight. The media coined them the poison pens. pens yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, Christopher went to Hong Kong and was... Madonna's personal assistant slash dresser. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's actually, if you go on YouTube, uh, there's a documentary, uh, probably about an hour long. It was made for British television, which is about the making of Shanghai Surprise. And it is messy. I mean, it's like George Harrison, Sean Penn, Madonna. It's great. But yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a, that's actually a a big part of that chapter. And it's, it's, it's very interesting to, to, to read how, you know, Madonna and Sean Penn were trying to like, create something but they didn't know what they were trying to create you know it's well, like a- sean was very critical of madonna as an actress yeah. and kept saying like you're a singer you're not an actress yeah and and then she's like no but we're gonna make films together we're gonna be like 
Spencer Tracy and it's like no you're not going to be like Spencer no. Tracy and Catherine Hepburn you know so it's like I don't know it it was it was kind of strange because they wanted to work together creatively but it didn't seem to it just wasn't right you know like at the same time they were going to be in blind date together um, they were yeah so Bruce Willis's first movie was going to be Madonna was going to play the crazy girl and Sean Penn was going to play her crazy ex-boyfriend and that fell through because they tried you know Madonna and Sean Penn tried to tell the producer what to do. And then another one was Ruthless People. They were also going to be in that together. They were going to play the kidnappers. Oh my God. <laughs> I did not know and that. And then that also didn't happen because they were trying to micromanage the, you know, the director and the producer. So it's like, oh I can only, I mean, those are the two that I've read about, but I can only imagine that they were going crazy in Hollywood saying like, we're new in town and we're going to, we're going to be the next pair you know the next uh fearless duo and it's like oh, you guys should have just not made movies <laughs> i mean so like eventually they split yeah. and the next person that's like a big formative figure in madonna's life is the one the only warren Beatty. well no first, before <laughs> no it, no before that sandra bernhardt oh yeah sandra bernhardt yeah, yeah. Um, and they all came together, you know, because kind of. uh, yeah. Sandra Bernhardt was actually friends with Warren Beatty. And she was friends with Sean Penn. And she was friends with Sean Penn because, you know. She, she, Sandra at one point claimed that she introduced Madonna and Sean Penn, but that's not true. No, no. Sean Penn uh, found out about Madonna and found a way to get on set for Material Girl. But yeah, but I do believe, you know, Sandra Bernhardt had this like crazy credibility from being in Scorsese, uh, Scorsese's King of Comedy, and also just being really edgy and, you know, and out there. For, she was a very huge comedian in, in other New York words, City. Yeah. If you were cool in the 80s, you wanted to hang out with her, you know? So yeah, so this was like a whole crew, you know, Jennifer Grey was also part of that crew, uh, you know, Debbie Mazar. I can only imagine, you know, um, and then look at the cast for Dick Tracy. Those were friends Warren Beatty called favors on. So, yeah, so Christopher was part of this scene and uh, Sandra Bernhardt came on strong, wouldn't you say? Well, he, he does say he said that eventually it was Sandra's negative attitude that wore on both of them. Mm -hmm. Who knows? But but he really said that. This is significant for one reason. Well, no, I mean, Sandra Bernhardt is significant for so many reasons. Oh. But in terms of Madonna's overall story, yes, there was the the, the greatest Letterman appearance of all time mm -hmm. with with Sandra. Um, aside from that, the relation, the friendship with Sandra was critical because at the time, Sandra was dating Ingrid Casares, right. and she brings Ingrid to Madonna's 1991 New Year's Eve party. Mm -hmm. Basically, Christopher's, according to Christopher, he and Madonna were like kind of over Sandra yeah. by that point, but they invited her to, to the New Year's Eve party in 1991 anyway. She brings her girlfriend, Inward Casares, who, she who he describes as like a butch version of Audrey Hepburn. She right. was tall, thin, very cool. She was just like the rich daughter oh really yeah she was like okay. a rich daughter of like a cuban uh contractor in miami she was actually booking models for wilhelmina and that's how she met sandra sandra brought her into this fold but you know christopher didn't even know what he what, what he had in front of him with this woman right she said <laughs> he, he yeah he said that the minute ingrid met madonna sandra was history mm -hmm. and madonna would embark on the most enduring liaison of her entire life which is confounding in so many ways because we don't know what their relationship actually well, was like. Well, he doesn't like. say that they You're were right. sleeping together. It just basically that for over 15 years, now maybe it's even, yeah. I think they're still oh, really yeah. close. Yeah, they're still for close. For over like 25 years, this friendship would endure mm -hmm. and basically Ingrid never asked for anything. She, she always money. She always paid her own way. He doesn't know if they ever slept together. Mm -hmm. and But he does say Ingrid and Madonna have nothing in common except they're both in love with Madonna. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, do we know if Ingrid has like a part, like did, she had to have had other relationships. I mean, I'm sure, you know, I know Ingrid has a son that she uh, has been raising on her own. So, you know, who knows who the father mm. might be. Um, he says that Madonna was, is addicted to Ingrid. Yeah. And, and, I, and, and that Ingrid was, like Madonna's like yes woman. Yeah, and I can see that because through the 90s you're like why is she there, you know? I mean, it, 
that's how we saw Madonna in the 90s. You would see photos of her, you know, coming out of a premiere or, you know, going to a party. Do you think she's still, do you think Christopher and Ingrid are still friends? I think, you know, Ingrid is pretty much like the social queen of Miami, I would say. You know, maybe not so much what now. What does she own? She owned a place called Liquid that was really big in the 90s. Um, in fact, she was hanging out with all these like really shady, you know, nightclub people. Like there was a guy named Chris Pacello who went to prison for some kind of mob hit or whatever. Anyway, she introduced him to Madonna who dated him for a while. Like, look that up, you know? Interesting. Um, I think Christopher mentioned in the book that um, she did find guys for Madonna, that Ingrid uh-huh. would find guys for her to go out with, you know, like John Enos, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was just, it just seemed like a very specific time in Miami in the 90s, you know, with like, you know, as Christopher will very happily mention, you know, Kate and Naomi. And, oh, yeah, well, no, we're going to get into and that. And Donatella <laughs> and Gianni Versace, who he also reveals they weren't that close. So at this point, before we get to Warren Beatty and the Blonde Ambition mm-hmm. Tour, so now that she is divorced from Sean Penn, she asks Christopher to, to design and decorate her New York apartment, which she right. eventually would combine three different floors. Right. I and mean, this is the place on 64th Street and, and Central, Central Park. Park. West, yeah. yeah. And you were saying like about like the real estate porn. Mm-hmm. Oh, amazing. So yes, every, you know, and this starts with, uh, with the Sean Penn Malibu house. You know, uh, he's brought into you know, redecorate, renovate, reinvent, if you will. And he just goes into detail, painstaking detail about what he does to these spaces and what kind of furniture, what kind of uh, sensibility. The lighting. Yeah, lighting. And it's like, oh my God, I want a virtual tour right now, you know? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, basically, so she was like, basically this was going to be her New York estate without Sean, like the fresh start without Sean. Eventually she would combine three apartments. Mm -hmm. And you know what the funny thing about that is, is that, Years before, when her and Sean got married, they went to the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side, and no co-op board would sell them an apartment. I remember that. (laughs) I remember that. But when she was a single lady, it was a different story. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And he designed everything. He designed every home of hers until 2008. I mean, I guess until the Guy Ritchie era. Yeah. So I think the last home that he designed for her was the Los Feliz home, which was after the Guy Ritchie. It was the last Guy Ritchie, that last home she shared with Guy Ritchie. With Guy Ritchie. Yeah. Oh, yes, because the closets. I remember Guy Ritchie's closet. He was, yeah, he wanted them to be not, very not, masculine. Yeah. He didn't want them to be twee. Nothing twee. Or um, <laughs> mincy. <laughs> and the, the, the scary part is that I could see Guy Ritchie saying that stuff. She's so event- so now she's with Warren Beatty mm-hmm. and Christopher says that Christopher says Madonna said Warren asked her to marry him yeah. like multiple times and she, she cheated on him. Well, yeah, not only did she cheat on him, but at this point, I think it was around the time like she was maybe like a germ of starting to think like one day I'll have a child. Yeah. And she acknowledged that she thought he would make a good father. Mm-hmm. Like she admired him, but she was cheating on him the entire time. Yeah. He hated that they were doing the documentary. Yeah. And but it's it's nice to know yeah. that Warren and Christopher had a nice relationship of their own. You know? Yeah. He, yeah. He said that he was like genuinely saying like. Like, he was interested what is in it like his to life. Be gay yeah. and blah blah blah. Um, okay, blonde ambition tour. Mm-hmm. Let's let's. So yeah. So as you mentioned, uh, Christopher designed, produced, created, creative director. So he was her artistic director mm-hmm. and designed the stage for Blonde Ambition yeah. Tour. A hundred. He was paid one hundred thousand dollars. I it cannot. You know, and, and, you know, we'll get into this as we get into his design work for her, too. But, you know, because they're family, and this will be put in quotes, there would be no contracts, there would be no invoices, it would just there be... There was never a contract yeah. between them until the very end. Exactly. So this was an, an oral agreement, which it's just not advisable, you know? Nothing was ever looked over by a lawyer. I that mean, way, that way, I mean, there's no consistency from event or uh, or show or or job you know so he couldn't tell madonna they're like well you paid me 100 last time you can pay me 250 this time i don't know i don't know but the fact is that he was being taken advantage of he hated so yeah the blonde bachelor was concurrent with the filming of truth or dare and yeah. he was so angry that they filmed that grave scene like the one where yeah. promise to try is over it he didn't know that there were going to be cameras right so he was furious right and about you know that. 
I was very naive, as I'm sure a lot of people were when they first saw Truth or Dare, and I believed it as the gospel truth, you know? I mean, it was like literally the Bible to me. It was interesting to actually hear Christopher say that it was mostly staged, you know? I mean, I get it now, you know, as a as a <laughs> fully realized adult who's watched Bravo for a long time. Mm-hmm. I understand what staging reality looks mm-hmm. like and what it feels like, but Truth or Dare was actually the first time I ever saw that. So I had nothing to compare it to. Yeah, he said that in reality, she was far more likely to like put her foot in her mouth or to just like blurt things out. Mm -hmm. Like she had a little bit of she has like a little bit of like an impulsive. uh, You can see it when she does these Instagram lives like that. She just she's not that. You can also see it at the very, very, very beginning of Truth or Dare where she's like, Alec, you can't come in here. I'm getting an adjustment. You know, like Mm -hmm. we talked about this, you know, like you can't do this, you know. And then all of a sudden she's like. I'm going to take my top off while my dad's in the next room. You know, I love it. <laughs> I know. I love it too. <laughs> he said, he does say that Warren Beatty went through Madonna's trash looking for proof of cheating. I know. I, I, Ooh, I can you imagine what you must feel like when you see something like that. And you know, he's, he's, he said, I never brought it up to Warren and I never told Madonna. He says that the scene in Truth or Dare where Madonna is at breakfast with Sandra Bernhard mm-hmm. talking about her parents. Oh, yeah. She said, she said that he said that's the most accurate to the real person mm-hmm. in the movie. I mean, I do think there's more genuine moments than he's like leading on. I think. That yeah, I mean, like, maybe he was jealous he wasn't invited on the bed at the end, you know, because <laughs> that whole thing, you can't stage that. That's just, yeah. you know, kiki. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of natural stuff going on in Truth or Dare. Oh, yeah. Come on. Are we going to rehearse the scene? I mean, in the Truth Chanel or Dare store? is not the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. No, like, come it's, not, on. it's not even the Real Housewives of uh, Pontiac, Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at this point, so now a couple of years go by, and now he says he wants to design and direct mm-hmm. the Girly Show, and he said it was at this point. So now we're at like ninety three. Yes, he said the gulf between Danny, his long term partner, and Madonna was sort of at its breaking point. And I Mm -hmm. think it was around this time, or maybe he was with, maybe he continued with Danny a few more years, but it was sort of like reaching its, its breaking point. And so he gets the job. He's going to direct the girly show, which I have to say, widely regarded as Madonna's greatest tour. I, I agree too. I think it's very artistic. It has a lot of amazing references that the, pedestrian there's that word again madonna fan just didn't get immediately you Mm -hmm. know um it was very cinematic as as well uh but yeah i mean it was i feel like out of all her shows it's probably the most artistic this would be the last live show the last tour that christopher would have anything to do with now she did take a big break because she had lola and Mm -hmm. then it would be years before she would even come out with a new album that she would tour that she would tour with but also at that point she was with Guy Ritchie so we'll get into all of that but the girly show is the end of their their performance right well it's actually important to add that actually the last time they collaborated on a a performance where she sang was the uh, Brit's performance of Bedtime Story he directed that oh my god he mentioned that in the show yeah Yes, you're so right. I think that's their last artistic collaboration that doesn't include a home. <laughs> he talks about going to the rehearsal of the Drown World Tour, and he was very hurt that he was not. Initially, he was to to take part in it and be like yeah. design it, and then she was like, "I'm going with Jamie King. Mm-hmm. He's going to be." Is Jamie King a man or a woman? No, he's a man. Oh, it's a man? Yeah, he, he was. He was that guy. He started out with Britney and Justin, and he did okay, their yeah, shows. That's what yeah. I thought. She's like, she's like, actually, no, I am going to, mm-hmm. to go. Because like they were going back and forth. And then again, in yeah. the end, she fucks him. Um, fucks but over Christopher. Right. He also, when he was at that rehearsal, remember, he noticed that there were some elements that had been edited from previous shows that she was using and not giving him credit for. You mm-hmm. know, this is another instance where Christopher could have probably spoken up for himself and said, no, um, cease and desist. You he, know, he did not like the girl. I'm sorry. He he didn't like drown world no. at all he he felt i mean according to him there was just way too much guy richie influence like all the the violence and and all that it, yeah it was, too, it, way it was too dark it was and dark. not what the audience is looking for right i mean look at it this way drowned world was her only show to not have vogue mm. in it you know Interesting. and that's like her biggest hit forever you know he did eventually 
I think he obviously like went to see that live. He did go to see Confessions. Mm-hmm. He he talks about that. I remember he seeing a photo of him at Confessions. It's interesting his commentary on her live stuff, her live tour. Mm-hmm. Post him, po- everything post the girly show. He says a couple things. He says, quote, her performance lost its um, theat- theatricality. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Can't read. He said, her, he said her performance lost its theatricality to me. It lost its connection to the audience. That was disappointing. How many tours have there been since 94? Five, which mm-hmm. it's true. She then went on a whole tear touring like year after year. Yeah. He said, it's difficult to watch because I know what she's capable of. This, this next quote, I think really is accurate and rings true. Mm-hmm. It's all screens and projections and Kabbalah and all this other stuff that the audience doesn't really connect to. Yeah, I mean, I didn't see screens at Blonde Ambition or a girly show. Drowned, but that also wasn't the thing then. Yeah, I mean, in Drowned World, I, the, the video was minimal. You know, there was the Paradise Not For Me and then there was, uh, you know, it was it was almost like every other song had like a video element, but now everything's video. So do you think that if Christopher were still working with her, there would be, it would still be like the girly show? Like every tour, like Britney Spears, right. Justin Timberlake, it's all screens. Yeah. I would like to think that Christopher would have a different sensibility where he would use video, but maybe sparingly or more like an installation as opposed to look up here now, mm-hmm. you know? Um, like, you know, there are times when Madonna's done that and it's been incredibly lazy. Like I, the, the one thing that really comes up is uh in sticky and sweet where she does that animated interlude to here comes the rain again by the eurythmics Mm -hmm. that made no sense it still doesn't make sense Mm -hmm. you know and you could put a song in there in madame x the only video isn't the main the main video was with lola for frozen each song has like a video backdrop but like what's the problem with that I don't know. I mean, what, what I thought was actually really funny because, you know, I saw the show several times and towards the end I started to realize, I was like, oh, they're showing, they're projecting the Like a Prayer video whilst they're singing Like a Prayer. Yes. And it's queued up. Yes. I did notice that. Um, and then I think they did that a couple of, you know, other times. But, mm-hmm. you know, at this point, when you're seeing Madonna that close up and it's a theater experience, I, video is irrelevant, you know? Totally. And, and I feel like let's, let's go back to basics, mm-hmm. you know? So at this point, this is like the peak, I mm-hmm. think. Yeah. So this is like pre-Guy Ritchie. He's now directing and designing the girly show. Yeah. And he says something very uh, self-aware. He says, living in my sister's shadow always makes me question my artistic abilities. Even when I sell eight of my painting, or even when I sell eight of my paintings, three of them to David Geffen, it isn't clear if my art is any good. Or if my success is predicated on her fame. Right. Yeah. He mentioned that during the Paris stop of the girly show, Gautier set up an exhibition of his works at a, at, in his store. And it was a big event. You know, all the paparazzi were there. Madonna showed up begrudgingly. But, you know, he also admits, he's like, I wonder if this opportunity would have been extended to me if I were not related to Madonna. You know? Like, obviously not. I know. That's what I said. I was like. But take the opportunity and be like fucking thankful yeah which i think he was i think if i don't know she was such a dick to him i know that, <laughs> she was such a dick to him and then she'd be nice to him she'd give him all these opportunities but i don't know yeah i feel What's like the relationship status now i don't know i don't Have know they reconciled? I, f- I feel like i've read that they are on speaking terms like isn't her father still alive oh yeah yeah and and i you know how he's got the, that vineyard the, yeah, the tony vineyard how can the dad still be alive at this age like he's got he, he's in his 90s yeah. there's no way madonna yeah. is like 63 62 yeah. and she's not the youngest one she's not the oldest one no so the father has to be in his 90s i would think at this it's your family and like the father is this old i would just feel like yeah although like he did write this fucking book <laughs> <laughs> so now we're into like the mid 90s yeah. basically this is like post bedtime stories pre Evita, we're like in the sweet spot of like 95, 96. And he references a, like a term that Madonna would use. Basically, she was sort of auditioning different, fathers for different her children. Yeah. She'd be like, like, oh, like he would be good for the daddy chair. Yeah. 
and eventually she meets Carlos Leon in the park, running in Central Park, mm -hmm. and they're like he he does say that she genuinely loved him, but like ultimately he just like couldn't keep up with her. But it, but that she she really did love him. Yeah. It just didn't work out. During this time, Christopher really started partying with models like Naomi Campbell, Kate Moss, Johnny Depp was around. The thing about this book that is yeah, please. that I <laughs> I, I want to send him a fruit basket. It's like, thank you for dropping every name you've ever picked up, you know, because that's but what... But he was partying with them. Exactly. He, like, eventually, the big crux of why this relationship fell out was Madonna started to accuse him of, accuse him of having a drug yeah. problem. And he claims it was like a casual, like it would just be rather casual but but then it's like not casual it's not casual if you're doing it every night you know and she I mean, also hated him because she because he was doing it with like these big names yeah exactly you know she was I, jealous maybe or, or maybe she wasn't jealous maybe she was just like she's always set herself aside as the one who i mean madonna's never been to rehab she's never had a nervous breakdown she didn't start drinking till she's fucking yeah 60. she didn't start drinking until she was older <laughs> you know so it's like i'm sure if people let's say the bathroom at the Met Ball, people start pulling out lines. Madonna's going to walk out of that room because yeah. she's like, I just, I don't get it. You know, it's mm -hmm. like if I'm a vegetarian and everyone's going to go get fried chicken. Which by the way, <laughs> this was part of the reason that I, in not initially, but just like all, it's, it's something that kept me propelled with her. What, like, cause I'm also like not a drug person. Oh, yeah, me too. And funnily enough, I really didn't even really start drinking until, Re recently like i'm 38 years old and it's really only in the past like few years that yeah. i've like figured out what kind of cocktail i like <laughs> like i don't know like i didn't drink like all my 20s and most of my 30s oh yeah like, no i i totally get I it i didn't that, care that was another thing that was very attractive to being a to admiring and you Same. know following madonna is yeah. i you know she has a very like regimented life and i would like to have that kind of life you know i don't want to emulate um I don't want to emulate Axl Rose because I don't want to look like that. You know, <laughs> he, said, he says at the beginning of the book that Madonna could run like a prison. <laughs> yeah. But then again, it's so weird. Prison like, matron. I love that. But can I just tell you something? Watching that Instagram live, she just seems like a mess. Like I wouldn't trust her to run any. I wouldn't trust her to open the door for me. Mm -mm. Is that just age? <sighs> Is that just like getting older? You know, she's just I, like I, a little I've thought about the same thing with her because it's like almost like, wow, it's almost like she doesn't care. You know, but I think what it is, is that she has nothing to prove to anybody anymore. You know, it's so interesting. Like yeah. she was so diligent in all throughout mm -hmm. her 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And now all that diligence is in notebooks in her like, living room. <laughs> I know, like she drinks and like you see her like on her birthday, like, like you just see her with like running around with like these 24 year old. I'm just like, how is this the same person? I know. I, it's just funny. And I'm also like, can you get it together to write this movie? Like, I need this thing to be good. Yeah, we need Like, this. I want the diligent, like, one run, running the prison to write the movie. Let's talk about this movie for, like, a hot second. Ooh, I mean, yes. I'm going to give you two names and you tell me which movie you think it's going to be like. What's Love Got to Do With It? Eight Mile. Oh, my God. That's <laughs> so funny. Remind me what's Love Got to Do With It? Uh, Tina Turner with Angela Bassett. Oh, I didn't see that. Oh, but I've see seen that. Eight Mile like that, four million times. Or okay, um, Glitter, <laughs> Eight Mile. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> because you know what I mean. Glitter is like was what a, love's got not got to do with it. Was that a flop? Well, no, no, it was a huge hit. Like Angela Bassett was nominated for an Oscar, but it's a it's a very it's a very serious, heavy handed autobiography of Tina Turner. You know, whereas Eight Mile is kind of like a fantasy version of his life it's gonna be a fantasy version. yeah so that's what i'm thinking it's gonna be like eight mile where she's gonna take liberties with her origin story and i mythology. like i like that she said it's not gonna be a musical it's not gonna be like rocket man where they just like burst into song and all of a sudden he's flying through the air oh, is it's, that what they did because i won't watch that that was rocket man <laughs> i actually liked it I but i, mean, I did I, like I saw bohemian here, rhapsody though i love that too yeah, that was good yeah um rocket man is great yeah i mean but yes it's like fantastical mm -hmm. a little bit it's very creative. Yeah. It's very Elton John. I don't, yeah, and that's cool, but I don't think that you could do that with Madonna because she's so rooted in reality. No, no, no. These are very different yeah. people. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I like that she said it's not, it's not a musical in like the traditional mm -hmm. sense, but her songs, she, like the character of Madonna is going to sing when it's appropriate to sing. Right. 
Like you'll see her in the recording studio. She said they're going to have her showing how she wrote like a prayer. Like love to see it. I'm terrified. Like, keep it. Oh God. <laughs> I don't want it to be like Crossroads where uh, oh, no. where Brittany's like, I wrote a poem. Um, I'm not a girl, not yet a woman. Oh, wait, let's put that to music. Boom. You know? End scene. <laughs> oh, my God. Wait, can we talk about, we're talking about some of these arguments and fights that they're having. Yeah. Can we talk, talk about the fact that a lot of these fights are taking place over faxes. Yes, These are like faxes. fax machine fights. And this is like even into the early 2000s when people could email I was very confused by this. Yeah, me too. Um, I know that... Like, how is it that they weren't emailing? Or is this his memory is like, off? No, no, no. I think... I remember, you know, like when in the 90s, you read a lot of these, like... You know, the 90s were very big on star profiles in magazines like Movie Line, Vanity Fair, you know, whatever. And it was always mentioned in these stories, you know, like, let's say they're interviewing Brad Pitt, and they're like, you know, I reached him by fax, you know? So I... Different stories like that, and also people in the music industry, I feel like they were using the facts because it was the one way where they could send messages where no one else would be able to see them. That's my hmm. takeaway from that, you know? But anybody could pick up a fax. I know, I know. But if it's like in your room and it's just you. I guess. You know, I, but yeah, the whole thing just seemed really strange to me because every time I would hear him say something about a fax he wrote to Madonna, I just imagined a fax machine in the corner of a room and I'm just like, why? It's so funny. <laughs> it's so funny. Just Madonna faxing everything. Um, I, okay. Can you see her like putting that paper through the feeder, just waiting for it to beep? Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, eventually Christopher forms these friendships with Donatella Versace, mm -hmm. Demi Moore, Courtney Love. Like he really paints an interesting picture of like the nights that he would have with mm -hmm. them. Those hot, sultry Miami nights. But his best friend, and he says the best friend like from this circle who he says was the best candidate for the quote unquote sister chair mm -hmm. was none other than Gwyneth Paltrow. Yes. This I love. I love this, this for I Chris. Love I love this for Christopher. I remember reading star profile cover story on Gwyneth and probably Harper's Bazaar or Vogue. And she's, you know, it's one of those like Gwyneth is smoking, you know, taking some long drags from a Marlboro light while drinking a coffee, uh, getting her hair curled. And she says, if someone says they hate Madonna, I can't be their friend, you know? So when I read that, I was like, that's interesting. And then cut to Madonna and Gwyneth are best friends, you know? I know. And Christopher is all up in that. And, uh, you know, suddenly everyone's got a British accent. And I don't know what happened with them. I think when they had the big falling out, I think Madonna said to Gwyneth Paltrow, Madonna ultimately controlled yeah. these friendships and I yeah. think, and she sort of blacklisted him in Hollywood, particularly when this book came out. Oh, yeah. He like didn't work for no. a long time. No, because before, you're right, because before the book, he was directing music videos. Mm -hmm. Famously, he directed the Peace Train video for Dolly Parton and he did video for Albita. But yeah, I mean, that went, he, that went to a screeching halt. He designed a restaurant for Johnny Depp mm -hmm. in Hollywood. Oh, he wound up on the cover of the Inquirer and and Star magazine because he was dancing like wasted with Demi Moore. Right. And I think Madonna was really yeah. About like, that. Well, um, who introduced you? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, there, that's mostly what was going on along that time. He never had a close relationship with with Lola, even after she was born. But really, what did it in? was Guy Ritchie. Yeah. So cut to eventually Madonna starts to date Guy Ritchie and... And then another era begins. Yeah, sort of like take us into the Guy Ritchie it's like of it all. It's like Britannica Madonna, you know? Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I mean, we all noticed this that, you know, once she started dating Guy Ritchie who she met through uh, Trudy Styler and Sting that she decided that she was going to become a proper English lady and... Um, he likes to fashion himself as some sort of like street tough, but you know, he comes from like a pretty posh family. You know, I think there's, um, you know, there's like, you know, some high ranking military people in his yeah. family and, you know, um, but he comes across to anyone that'll listen that you know, he's some sort of street tough, you know, that is rough and tumble, you know, in the streets of London and those are all his friends. And, you know, it's, it's a certain type of, you know, British male, you know, and I think Madonna was very attracted to that, you know, going back to the Sean Penn, you know, that tough guy persona that she has always fallen really hard for, right? <laughs> he says that 
she marries Guy because she's getting she's vulnerable. She's getting older. She needs a father for Rocco. At this point, right. she's pregnant. She needs a father for Rocco, and he reminds her of Sean. And also, anything that she throws at Guy Ritchie, he sucks right up. Like suddenly, he's like a leading authority in the Kabbalah world. You know. Very strict adherent to a macrobiotic diet. All these things, you know, that Madonna loves, you know, giving some somebody something to do under her watchful eye is happening with Guy Ritchie, and she couldn't be happier, you know? He described... So the wedding to Guy Ritchie, mm-hmm. which took place in Scotland, I believe... I mean, that could have been one book on its own. It was crazy. <laughs> it's, it just seemed so uncomfortable and, like, yeah. awkward. But was but it was interesting that... I th- was it her sister... Was it Melanie or Paula? It was Paula who wasn't going to go. So Paula initially wasn't invited, and then she asked Madonna said i really want to come to your wedding i'm a graphic designer cut me a break yeah she wasn't gonna pay for her her flight out eventually i don't even remember how she got there but she she came and madonna's two um, maids of honor were like stella mccartney and somebody and and i maybe gwyneth paltrow somebody else who like she like really didn't even know that yeah that makes me so crazy you know um one thing that i took away from this book too is that she has a very selective way of excluding people with money you know like was debbie mazar at the guy ritchie wedding oh, there was no I, mention oh i'm of sure her. she was but yeah. wouldn't debbie mazar have been the maid of honor no nah, i mean you know they've known each other forever it's like oh, whatever you know that's how i feel wow. about it you know hmm. like I, I feel like they're the kind of friends that they come back to each other when they can but i've heard debbie say this about madonna too she's like she does not suffer fools with her when madonna starts her stuff she walks away really yeah listen. oh i love that yeah. uh, i'll tell you where uh, you can find it. oh i love that i love that <laughs> Um, he, he's continuing his, his art career and his, his interior design career. It's bridging into restaurants. Um, he designed a few things in Miami Mm -hmm. and in, in 2001, Bill Clinton personally picks his furniture for his line for, for his Harlem office from Christopher's line. That's right. I remember he came out with a furniture line and I was like, where do I get this? (laughs) And to this day, that is, if you go to Christopher Ciccone.com, he's an interior designer. Mm -hmm. No, and he's very talented. I yeah. mean, I, I love his his very clean lines, and you know, everything is everything looks really looks really nice, and it's not overdone. You know, going back to the wedding itself, he yeah. basically says that an ongoing theme at the wedding were guys friends. Mm-hmm. Basically insinuating that guy is gay, yeah, because he's so uncomfortable with his own masculinity just like his own self yeah and i you know i noticed this in british male groups you know it's like like when we say like oh we're gonna take the piss out of him or whatever Mm -hmm. you know so let's say i'm hanging out with like 10 british straight guys you know they're just gonna tell you all night he's like ah if i have one more drink i'm gonna fuck you up the ass you know and it's Mm -hmm. like that kind of talk and it's it is what it is but you know i'm sure christopher was like do i really need to hear another homophobic joke yeah Again, and, while I'm and, here. And it was Gwyneth Paltrow who was like, come here, like, we'll yeah. take care of you. Like, I, I mean, know. he even it mentioned... It made me love Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah, he even mentions, like, Piers Morgan was there. He was one of those guys saying something like that, too. You know, he called him a poofter Oh, whatever. my God. I don't remember um, that. Yeah, you know, he dropped the name. I picked it wow. up. Wow. You know? But yeah, I mean, I thought that was sweet of, uh, you know, Gwyneth. You know, she said, come here, Christopher. We're going to take care of you, you know? In the end, I think... But just, like, the combo of... Her going in a different direction for the Drowned World Tour, the marriage to Guy Ritchie, but in the end, it all came down to, it was like a new house, mm-hmm. like something like she she eventually went with a different decorator, and it just really saddened him. It was like the first home that he didn't have a room in, the first home that like he just felt didn't have his fingerprint yeah on, and, and i think he mentioned that he went to the house and he he said it looked it looked like a mess mm-hmm. i think that's exactly yeah. what he said actually yeah and the final time of him of, of madonna fucking him over she sent him to bid sixty five thousand dollars at sotheby's mm-hmm. and it was the first time that he just laid it out in his own money yeah which i found that strange like why did he do that and she says yes yes i want them so they arrive she says, actually, I don't like them. Mm-hmm. I, I don't want it. And she's just like, I don't care. And like she knew Sotheby's policy is you can only basically like if you don't want something, you, you have to wait for it to be you have like to wait for the next auction. Yeah. And if it sells below what you paid for it, mm-hmm. that's only what you're getting. Right. And she didn't care. 
why was she so is she just like punishing him i think so and then you know there's the other it's thing like we need her side of the story yeah. yeah there's the other thing too that he talks about where um you know he outfitted the home you know bought all the furniture and he finds out from one of the dealers that she returned it and she finds out that he added the decorator markup, which is standard. We all know this. Everyone knows she this. She lost it. She lost it. This, yeah. That was the final and thing. What, isn't the markup like, what, 10, 15%? Yeah. I mean, Madonna, she was already underpaying him. But I can see why she'd get yeah. past. Yeah. And, it, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, it wasn't her that went to the dealer. It was like probably third, fourth hand. Yeah. And that probably made her even matter because <sighs> everyone else knew but her. I, I find Madonna to be one of those, you know, you know that certain type of person, they hate to be the last to know. Yeah, yeah. I feel like she's one of those. That's like kind of where it ends. Like when it ends, they're still married. Madonna and Guy are still, but they literally like. I feel like the book, when it actually published, she was in the process of. Really? Of getting love spent. Hmm. <laughs> he, I have a note here that he designed and directed her opening performance for the Grammys for Ray of Light in 1999. The kimono one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so he did continue to do a little bit, but not a major, not mm-hmm. the Drown World Tour, which is what he really wanted. Um, can we talk about Madonna's birthday party where everyone had to wear a kimono? <laughs> oh, yes, please, please. You, you go ahead. Yes. No, I'm just obsessed with that. I don't know which birthday party it was, but it probably must have been like 98 or 99, yeah. I would say. Madonna had a birthday party where, um, and I actually, this is the actual quote, no one is allowed to stay at the party if they're not wearing a kimono. So... That was the rule, you know. Uh, Christopher showed up wearing a very elaborate kimono he was very proud of that he bought in Japan. Uh, He's sitting there with Gwyneth, you know, smoking cigarettes, chatting as one does, and his kimono catches on fire. And luckily, he's wearing a black T-shirt underneath, but, you know, his kimono is burnt, and he takes it off. Madonna's like, you have to leave. And he's like, Madonna, my kimono is burnt. She's like, no one can stay at the party if they're not wearing a kimono. (laughs) It's so funny. But yeah, Ugh. let's let's see photos of a uh, kimono's only birthday party. <laughs> that that is like one of the, the best parts of this book, I think. <laughs> I so I mean, I don't. Yeah, I want to know what their relationship is now. I just don't think there's mm-hmm. any coming back. I mean, how you, you, he's never going to like work for no. her again. Oh, and one last takeaway that I had too is that I don't know if you noticed this, but he seems to have a big stake in her film career because you know he noticed he doesn't talk about songs, he doesn't talk about lyrics, he doesn't talk about actual you know performances but he goes into details about her film performances he just hates yeah. every you he, know he thinks evita was great but yeah. like ev- she brings him as her date to like many of the premieres yeah. of all of her films and he's just always like i just lied and told her she was great yeah no uh, for example in next best thing uh he sat in front of her and after the movie said you were funny in the film <laughs> like choose your words wisely <laughs> you were funny in the film, you know? I mean, so like well, overall, I mean, this is amazing. Mm-hmm. This is amazing. This is the closest we're going to get. Yeah. I I feel like the Diablo Cody biopic project, as I'm going to call it from now on, I feel mm-hmm. like it's going to be equal parts revisionist history, equal parts um, Madonna Fantasia. Mm-hmm. But I'm, I'm fine with that because I, I love any content that she puts out. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, I also want the truth, you know? Well, he, the, Christopher also says that whenever she would sort of tell her origin story, she was like changing it. Mm-hmm. Like it was just like a, a yeah. made up. Yeah. He did mention that, you know, there, um, I don't have the specific instances, but there were many things that she talks about as part of her origin. Actually, one of them is, uh, that she came to New York with $37 in her pocket. And he's like, no, she didn't. Well, she well, she wasn't wealthy, obviously, but like no. she had enough to like she had a place to live. She had a there, she had a support system in place of like dancer friends. Yeah. Like she had a network. Yeah, I mean, like I could. She didn't s- just like literally like fall off a wagon. Exactly. And, I mean, like in I could, Times Square. Right. I mean, yeah. I, I I could literally say the same thing. I came to New York October fourth, nineteen ninety nine. I had a twenty dollar bill in my pocket. I also had a bank account. Right. You know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so funny but you know that's the story people remember right oh my God. tony came to new york with 20 dollars. look at him now tony tell <laughs> everybody where they can find you where they can listen to you well uh you can find me and my podcast co-host slash collaborator stefan and mlbc podcast which is available 
anywhere podcasts are found. We also have a website. You can find us at mlvcpodcast.com. And of course, Instagram. Why not? At MLVC Podcast. Perfect. Guys, you can follow me, JessXNYC. Follow the show account, Hot Takes Deep Dives. Tony, this was so much fun. This like, was so much fun. I loved doing this with you. I, it, like, I learned, there were things that I like blacked out of the book. I'm like, oh. This was so much fun. Listen, if you find another trashy uh, memoir, let's <laughs> do it again. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye.